Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers. I'm Jim Papandrea. This podcast is a production of Catholic Culture. Sign up for our newsletter at catholicculture.org slash newsletter. Today we begin in earnest our series on the heresies. This is technically episode two, though episode one was our introduction to the series. In this episode, we'll talk about the heresies of the Judaizers and the Ebionites. We can already see in the pages of the New Testament in the middle of the first century that someone was offering an alternative to the message about Jesus Christ that the Apostle Paul was preaching. Remember that in about the year 50 AD, the Apostles had come to a decision about whether the early church was going to keep the whole of the Jewish law. That would have meant keeping kosher, and Peter had had that vision in which it was clear God was giving him permission to let go of that. But it also would have meant men having to be circumcised, which, from a purely practical standpoint, would have made evangelization more difficult. The outcome of that council meeting in Jerusalem in 50 AD was the decision that Gentile men would not have to be circumcised to become Christian, and Christians would not have to keep all the dietary laws of the Jewish faith. But apparently, after that council, a group of Pharisees, those who had argued in favor of a fully Jewish Christianity, they did not give up, and they went out and started preaching. So now, fast forward about four years later. The year is 54 AD, and Paul wrote a letter to the Christians in the region of Galatia, which is now in Turkey. He's writing from Ephesus on what we refer to as his second missionary journey. Perhaps he's staying for a while with the Apostle John in Ephesus. We don't really know. But he wrote the letter to warn the Christians of Galatia about these preachers. He says that there is a group of men from Jerusalem traveling around, and they claim to come with the authority of James, the bishop of Jerusalem. But that's not really true. They may have come from the church in Jerusalem, but they were not sent by James. They were, in fact, the faction that lost the debate at the Jerusalem Council. And he warns his audience not to listen to these preachers. He calls them false brothers who preach another gospel. But what is that other gospel? Well, it wasn't a gospel at all in the sense of good news. For a lot of people, it would be bad news. Because these Pharisees, these preachers, maintained that to be a Christian, as they defined Christianity, one had to follow the whole Jewish law, including, for men, circumcision. Now, these Pharisees are sometimes referred to as the circumcision faction, but more often, they are simply called the Judaizers. No doubt this is not a name they chose for themselves, but like a lot of our heresies, they are called this in hindsight or by their opponents. For them, The way to salvation was still, as it always had been, by obeying the law. They were happy to welcome the Gentiles in, but only if they were willing to follow the whole law. This is a salvation by the law, and we'll keep that in mind for later. And so, Paul responds. And his response is often caricatured as faith versus works. But it's not really faith versus works per se. It's more like faith in a divine Savior who saves those who cannot save themselves versus faith in one's own ability to follow the law and not break the rules. And so there were these Pharisees who could get on board with the idea of Jesus as a prophet and even as Messiah, but not as divine Savior. Unlike the pre-conversion Paul, they didn't persecute the church they tried to preach the Christians back into a more traditional Judaism. Accept Jesus as Messiah, they could. But what kind of Messiah? 
And of course, this is the question. And they probably misunderstood Jesus' own answer to the question. And that same misunderstanding would lead Jesus to downplay the title Messiah in his own preaching. And eventually, that same misunderstanding about what kind of Messiah Jesus meant to be, well, it would lead to his arrest and execution. Now, we don't have hard evidence in the New Testament that the Judaizers denied the divinity of Christ. But the church fathers, looking back on them from the second century, tell us that they did. And so, they must have also questioned the worship of Jesus, which would put them at odds with the clergy who were conducting liturgy that included the worship of Jesus. In any case, the consensus among the church fathers is that the Judaizers were the precursor to a group known as the Ebionites. Unlike the Judaizers, and in fact, unlike most of our heretics, the name Ebionites is actually what they called themselves. It is said to mean the poor ones. The Ebionites called themselves that because they were trying to imitate the original ideal of the apostles in the book of Acts, when the earliest Christians sold their property and lived a common life, or at least they tried to. But that didn't last. It doesn't even last until the end of the book of Acts. And there are very good reasons why it couldn't last. For one thing, the gospel had to spread. They had to take the gospel out to the world. But for another thing, in a world where slavery is a given, some of the early Christians were the property of other people. And so the idea of selling all of your property and then not starving to death was not really practical in many cases. But imagine a group who tried to keep that going into the second century. These are the Ebionites. And the sources tell us that most of the Ebionites were ascetics. They lived an austere lifestyle, denying themselves certain pleasures and luxuries. And we also read that they were vegetarians. Their opponents in the mainstream church would turn their name into an insult, saying that, They were poor, all right. They were intellectually poor because of their poor view of Christ. In other words, they did not believe in his divinity. They believed and preached what was essentially a version of Judaism with Jesus as the promised Messiah, but defining Messiah as a prophet, an anointed human, but not divine. When the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and Christianity and Judaism really begin to go their separate ways, the Ebionites may have seen themselves as a compromise between the newly emerging church and the newly emerging rabbinic Judaism. To be fair, the Old Testament only hints at a Messiah who is more than human. We see it in Daniel 7 and a few other places, and then also in the apocryphal book of 2 Esdras. So the Ebionites clearly thought that they were interpreting the person of Christ faithfully according to what their scriptures said about the Messiah. So to them, Jesus was an anointed man, chosen by God, but essentially just a man. And they thought that the doctrine of the divinity of Christ, not to mention the worship of Christ, compromised monotheism. Because God must be one, and there can only be one God. And so they reasoned that mainstream Christianity was preaching two gods. Now, spoiler alert, the mainstream church, the majority, they had an answer for why the worship of Christ did not imply two gods, but that will be the doctrine of the Trinity, and we'll get to that. One thing that everyone would agree on is that God must be immutable. To be immutable is to be unchanging. This is one of the very attributes of divinity. In other words, one of the things that defines what divinity is. God must be immutable because God is perfect and God is eternal. And any kind of change would compromise God's perfection. Change would imply going from better to worse or worse to better. And any kind of change would compromise God's eternal nature, because change is a function of time and can only be measured by time. And change is only possible for those creatures who are within time, 
but God is not within time. God is not bound by time, and so God does not change. And in terms of the Old Testament, God's immutability is described as God's faithfulness. God is unchanging, and so therefore God keeps the covenant promises. It is because God is unchanging that we know that God is trustworthy. And so the Ebionites thought that they were upholding the immutability of the divine. To them, the phrase, the word became flesh, would have sounded like the divine turned into a human, and that would be a change. And then to say that the divine could be born as a baby, grow up, and learn things, This seemed to them something that they had to defend God against. Therefore, to the Ebionites, Jesus Christ is not the result of an incarnation of the divine. He is an anointed man, like Moses or David, or one of the prophets in the Old Testament. And so, the bottom line is that they denied his divinity. Now, it used to be fashionable among some circles of scholars to refer to this as Jewish Christianity and it was even sometimes presented as the original form of Christianity, as though the doctrine of Christ's divinity came along later. But we can see very clearly that this was not the case, because Paul opposed the Judaizers, and the church fathers after him opposed the Ebionites. And when we read Paul, and we read the church fathers, we can see the overwhelming consensus in the mainstream church on the divinity of Christ. So who were these Ebionites? The earliest Ebionite teacher that we can name is one Theodotus, Theodotus the Elder. He's also known as Theodotus the Tanner or Theodotus the Cobbler, that is, the Shoemaker. But this is already approaching the end of the second century. This Theodotus was excommunicated from the church in Rome in the 190s by the bishop at the time, Victor of Rome. He was apparently teaching that Jesus was once a terrible sinner, but he had a conversion and then became righteous and became obedient to God. But notice what this means. Up until he was excommunicated, he was in the church. He was possibly even teaching as a lay catechist or philosopher, just as Justin Martyr was teaching in Rome a few decades earlier. Once his bishop realized what he was teaching, he would have been confronted. And assuming he refused to submit to the bishop's authority and teach what the mainstream church had received from the apostles, well, he was shown the proverbial door, and he was no longer welcome at the sacraments, unless he should submit. But he didn't, and his disciple took over after him. That disciple's name was also Theodotus, now called Theodotus the Younger, or Theodotus the banker. Now that he and his teacher had been excommunicated from the church, they continued teaching, and they gathered followers who were willing to leave the church with them, and they became a group known as the Melchizedekians. They taught that Christ was himself subject to a higher high priest, the priest Melchizedek, mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 14. Theodotus the Elder had other disciples as well who also became teachers, and we know two of their names, one Asclepiodotus and one Symmachus. We don't really know anything more about them, except that Symmachus was apparently famous for his opposition to the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, it appears that there were factions even among the faction depending on what exactly they thought Jesus was anointed by or with. Because even though they all taught that he was essentially a mere man, they did think that he was anointed or indwelt by some spiritual entity, not a divine nature, but a created spiritual entity. Still, that's how he was able to perform miracles. Most of the Ebionites thought the man Jesus was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But there are a few things to note about that. He would have been indwelt in the same way that a prophet would be, or he was filled with the Spirit in the same way that we might be. But they weren't all in agreement about whether the Holy Spirit was divine. Most seem to have assumed that the Holy Spirit was a created being, like a seraph or a cherub, 
They assumed that this indwelling began at Jesus' baptism, when the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. But for them, that meant that Jesus did not have the Holy Spirit before that moment. In any case, because the spiritual entity anointing or indwelling the man Jesus was thought to be the Holy Spirit, this branch of the Ebionite heresy is called spirit Christology. Jesus is thought to be a mere man, anointed or indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and most probably the Spirit is assumed to be a created being, not divine. Also, most Ebionites rejected the virgin birth. For them, Jesus is the biological son of Joseph. And this is one of the things that led them to reject the Gospel of Matthew. Or, it's probably the case that they edited Matthew down to create their own version. They took out the birth of Jesus with its virginal conception. And to the account of Jesus' baptism, they added the words of Psalm 2-7, Today I have begotten you, to make it sound like Jesus was not the Son of God until the moment of his baptism, and then he became the Son of God. They also apparently edited out other references to the divinity of Christ and changed Matthew's Blessed are the poor in spirit to match Luke's Blessed are the poor. This edited version of the Gospel of Matthew is probably what the Church Fathers were referring to when they said that Symmachus opposed Matthew's Gospel. And it's probably what they called the Gospel of the Ebionites, though that only exists in a few fragments now. The rest of the Ebionites seemed to have believed that the man Jesus was indwelt not by the Holy Spirit, but by an angel or an archangel. And so we call this version angel Christology. In fact, some scholars speculate that the argument in the letter to the Hebrews that Christ is superior to the angels, that's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 to 14, that might be aimed at an early version of angel Christology. For this group, Jesus is indwelt, but not from the time of his baptism, rather from the moment of his conception, And in fact, he is indwelt by the archangel Gabriel at the Annunciation, or in some versions, perhaps, by the archangel Michael. But the point is that these Ebionites accepted the virgin birth of Jesus, and so they had less motivation to edit the Gospel of Matthew. There is a group mentioned by the Church Fathers. They're called the Nazareans. Now, this could be just another name for the Ebionites in general, But there is also a Gospel of the Nazareans mentioned by some of the Church Fathers, which seems like it's a more complete version of Matthew's Gospel. And so it's very possible that these Nazareans are that subgroup of Ebionites who taught an angel Christology. This angel Christology is also reflected in a document called The Shepherd. It was written in the second century by someone named Hermas, who claims to be the brother of the Bishop of Rome, though that seems hard to believe given the content. Sometimes this document is referred to as the Shepherd of Hermas, but I find this confusing. For a long time I thought that Hermas must be a place, and then this shepherd is from there. But then when I actually studied the Church Fathers, I realized, no, that's not it. Hermas is the author, and the document is an allegorical treatise called The Shepherd. But here's the thing. In that document, the shepherd is not Christ. Christ is an angel, and salvation is earned by keeping the law. And by the way, the later church fathers who thought that this document should be in the Bible They were reading an edited version of it, one that was later doctored to conform to Orthodox Christology. So, it could be the case that the Ebionites split into two factions. The Melchizedekians were the larger faction, teaching spirit Christology, and the Nazareans were the smaller faction, teaching angel Christology. Or, that could be an oversimplification. Some of the later church fathers even believed a story that there was a person called Ebion who was the founder of the sect of the Ebionites. But there's no real evidence for this other than the repeated rumor. Either way, the name Ebionite eventually became an umbrella term for all of these early heretics 
who preached a human-only Jesus and who rejected the developing New Testament of the mainstream church, either by editing the canonical Gospels or rejecting them altogether. And, needless to say, they also rejected the letters of Paul, who had confronted the heresy of their predecessors, the Judaizers. And by the end of the second century, this anointing or indwelling of Jesus by a spiritual entity will come to be seen as a reward for Jesus' obedience. And it's a reward that any of us could hope to receive, but only if we become perfectly obedient as well. Now, this brings up an important point that is actually common to many of the heretics. In order to try to explain the person of Jesus Christ, and especially his miracles, it will be typical of the heresies to separate Jesus from the Christ as two beings. Jesus, the man, versus the Christ as a spiritual entity. And so, for the Ebionites, the man, Jesus, was indwelt by the spiritual entity called the Christ. But keep in mind two things about this. This spiritual entity called the Christ is not eternal, not divine, but rather created. And the indwelling itself was only temporary, either from Jesus' conception or his baptism, depending upon whether we're talking about angel Christology or spirit Christology. And then it ended at the cross. The Christ left Jesus before he died, and then his resurrection was not real. The resurrection is reduced to a metaphor for eternal life. He was raised to eternal life, but it was not a bodily resurrection. So now you can see what's at stake with the heresy of the Ebionites. For the Ebionites, Jesus Christ is not the Son of God who became human. He's a man who becomes a son of God like any Old Testament anointed person. He is not the son of God. He is a son of God. He is not the Christ, but a Christ. And what's more, he was not always a Christ, but he became a Christ. And the Ebionites believed that they could also become Christs, that they could, through obedience to the law, become equal to Jesus. Even in spirit Christology, Christ is a receiver of the Holy Spirit, not a giver of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not have the Holy Spirit before his baptism. He might have been anointed with the Spirit or filled with the Spirit, but not in any unique way. And again, we could be filled with the Spirit in exactly the same way. And so the problem is that the Jesus of the Ebionites is not really a Savior. And the Incarnation, such as it is, is not a divine rescue mission. For the Ebionites, Jesus may be a prophet, but his mission was not to save us, it was to preach how we might save ourselves. Jesus is therefore reduced to a good example to follow. If you hope to receive salvation, become like him. But it would not be him that saves you, it would be you becoming like him that saves you. And this is a salvation by obedience to the law. You might call it a kind of works righteousness, but it's not even so much earning salvation by doing good works. It's earning salvation by not breaking the law, by not sinning. And so it's not that you do good works to make up for sin. It's that you just don't sin. If you want salvation, follow the example of Jesus and don't sin. So, who were the church fathers that opposed this heresy and represented the mainstream? Well, admittedly, they had a difficult job because they had to show how the worship of Jesus was not compromising monotheism. And as I mentioned, ultimately the answer to that question is the doctrine of the Trinity, and we're going to be unpacking that all along the way as we go. Now, actually, the first theologian of the church to oppose this heresy is St. Paul himself. In his letter to the Galatians, he said that to put your trust for your salvation in a Jesus who is not divine is to trust in the flesh rather than in the spirit. 
Now, to be fair, the Ebionites would say that they put their trust in the law. But for Paul, that's even worse, because it is to hope you can earn salvation. And so, if the law saves, then, as Paul said, Christ died for nothing. And you've got to appreciate Paul's sense of humor. He says that if you follow the whole law, that is, if you submit to circumcision, you are cutting yourself off from Christ. And of course, Paul is clear about the divinity of Christ. In Colossians, for all the fullness of divinity dwells within his body. And Philippians 2, which is Paul's version of the prologue to John, he was in the form of God, meaning he started out divine, and he humbled himself, he emptied himself to become human. He was divine first, and came to live in a human life by a divine act of self-limitation. In the early 2nd century, we have the bishop Ignatius of Antioch. In one of his letters, he says this, Do not be deceived by strange doctrines or antiquated myths, since they are worthless. For if we continue to live in accordance with Judaism, we admit that we have not received grace. And so you see, the church fathers equated listening to the Ebionites with going back to Judaism. Well, then toward the end of the second century, we have the bishop Irenaeus of Lyon, who clarifies that when we call Jesus Christ the only begotten, begotten there does not mean created. It does not mean he is the product of regular human procreation. It means that he is the unique Son of God in a way that could never apply to us. Irenaeus also criticized the practice of separating Jesus from the Christ as though they are two different entities. He pointed out that Jesus Christ is one person, not two, and you can't even call the human nature Jesus and the divine nature Christ, because that divides the one Savior. The correct understanding of Jesus Christ is that the whole name and title Jesus Christ, refers to the one complete person who is our Savior. He is not just a prophet or a good example to follow. He is our divine rescuer, and as such, he must have real divinity. He has these two natures, divine and human. Irenaeus also affirms that in the church there are four Gospels, and only four, against those Ebionites and others who would edit or delete some of the Gospels. Incidentally, Irenaeus also tells us that the Ebionites did not use wine in their liturgy. This may be because they did not believe that the blood of Jesus has any saving effect for us. But in any case, if they had a Eucharist at all, they used only water, which only served to set them apart even more from the mainstream church. And so, the mainstream church opposed the teaching of the Ebionites by emphasizing the divinity of Christ. And we can see that already in the New Testament, in the letters of Paul, in the letter to the Hebrews, and in the Gospel of John. Christ is the divine Word of God and the agent of creation. He pre-exists His human life in His divine nature. In other words, He starts out divine and becomes a human. And to answer the concern of the immutability of the divine, it would eventually be clarified that when we read, the Word became flesh, it does not mean the Word turned into flesh, but rather, the divine Word came to be, came to live, within a human life, but not in a way that would compromise the immutability of the divine. The divine nature never changes. The Word only acquires a human nature. Well, there is nothing new under the sun, as they say, and, as I promised I would, whenever possible, I will say a few words about how the ancient heresies are still around. I think it's fair to say that the Christology of the Ebionites is still around in one way or another, most especially in the religions of Deism and Unitarianism. And I don't think that's too much of a critique, The Unitarians are Unitarians precisely because they are not Trinitarians, and I think they would be the first to admit that. But any religion that makes Jesus just a good man, and a good teacher and a prophet, 
but not really the unique and divine Son of God, that is the legacy of the Ebionites. One final note. To my mind, the message that God is not rescuing you, that He is only sending preachers to encourage you, that's not really good news. Paul called this message another gospel, but I think what he meant by that is that it is no gospel at all. At the end of the day, Christianity preaches a God who reaches out to us by literally coming down to be one of us. Ebionite Christology is something far less than that. Something like pointing out your own bootstraps and telling you to pull. We don't lack good examples. We lack the ability to follow them perfectly. What we need is forgiveness and grace. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ came to offer us. The mainstream Christian church rejected the Christ of the Ebionites because the Ebionites had rejected the Christ of the Incarnation. Next time on The Way of the Fathers, Docetics and Docetism, including the Nicolaitans and the Marcionites. Thanks for listening. De quorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant filium Dei Way of the Fathers is a production of catholicculture.org Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.